In this episode of Ask Paul Kirtley, we are going to talk about obtaining big sheets of birch bark. The benefits of being able to identify trees, bow drill polishing, carcass inspection of deer, what are we looking for, and what are my favorite things that I've made or that have been made for me. Welcome, welcome to episode 72 of Ask Paul Kirtley, where I answer your questions about wilderness bushcraft, survival skills, and outdoor life in general. So here I am again, back in the south of England and enjoying the early parts of spring. Everything's quite late this year, but at least the birds are singing. Um, there seem to be some dogs barking in the distance today, so if that gets picked up on the audio, I'm not being chased by a pack of hounds, it's just something over the other side of the valley property i think on the other side of the valley has some dogs that are barking a lot um anyway um we have some good questions first one uh from instagram this is from john holmes he asks uh well first of all he says as always thanks for your hard work and great content well as always you're very welcome um his question is i have a question about harvesting a birch bark i have trouble harvesting in sheets greater than shown here tending to tear and split fine for fire starting but less so for other applications sloyd sheaths containers etc i only ever harvest from dead trees could this be a factor any hints or tips would be greatly appreciated cheers john yeah um well i think i'm assuming that you're uk or europe um silver birch and yes um you know we have this conception of being able to get big big birch bark canoe sheets from birch and yes species in north america you can it is harder with the european birch species um what you'll also possibly know is that as you go further north uh, into the northern Scandinavia into Russia is that the birch bark is thicker um, as you come further south into the more temperate areas it will grow thinner it, the tree doesn't need as much protection and so yes it can be harder and you combine that with areas of managed woodland where birch trees aren't always allowed to get particularly big um, because other trees are encouraged more than nature might allow. Um, you don't always find big birch trees, you certainly don't find big birch trees having fulfilled their natural life and therefore supplying nice big sheets of bark. But the other thing with silver birch is that you don't get with some other species of birch is that when they do get bigger the bottom of the trunks crack up and also you can get that black diamond shape cracking further up as well and that can leave not so much in the way of clean sheets to remove so i would say for all of those reasons it, that might be why you're having difficulty that doesn't mean to say that you can't get decent big sheets of birch bark because there's, there's there's a good craft tradition of using birch bark in um northern uh, parts of, of eurasia as it were whether that's in northern scandinavia or whether it's in um you know parts of russia that there is you know baskets footwear um sheaths for knives um, often torn into strips and woven for making baskets rather than used in complete sheets but still um, I think it's just a case of keeping your eye out but if you're in areas of very managed woodland where um, there aren't a lot of big birch trees that just come down and, and are left naturally then you might be finding it hard to find those those sheets so I would just say keep your eye out or maybe if there are other people um, if you can make contact with people um, on the internet that you know that have a shared interest in bushcraft and maybe live a bit further north in Sweden or Norway, maybe see if you can get some of them to send you some of those nice thick sheets um, in exchange for something else. That would be something that I would recommend. But they're definitely out there. It's whether or not you're in the right place at the right time. 
I know that's a bit of a vague answer, but um, for all of those reasons, that's why you might not be finding them exactly where you are. The benefits of being able to ID trees. This is via Twitter from Mark Blackwell. And he asks, what are the benefits of being able to ID trees in bushcraft in everyday life? Um, well, I'm not sure I can speak in general for everyday life, apart from knowing what's going on around you, apart from walking around half asleep, not, but, you know, not knowing what the things are that are you know, in your in your environment but then a lot of people don't spend a lot of time out in any sort of natural environment you know in um, in the modern world in developed countries 80 percent of the population tends to live in urban or suburban environments so they don't get a lot of contact with the natural environment in a lot of places and you have to make an effort to get away from the cities and away from the streets to to get into the woods to get into nature to to fully um, experience that but in terms of bushcraft, the the um, the advantage is very very clear. Um, I've I've mentioned this before, but I'll I'll say it again. Um, fundamentally, you cannot really do anything in bushcraft unless you can identify the natural resources. Bushcraft is not about collecting knives and axes and canvas haversacks and leather kit that's not bushcraft that's equipment a lot of it's traditional and it's associated with people who have promoted bushcraft as a skill set whether that's nesmuk or mason or even baden powell but that's not bushcraft that's equipment what's bushcraft and i know people don't like me being dogmatic about this tough okay myself and other people who have spent a long time studying this and a long time teaching this and i know that people like ray mears who i used to work with shares this view and i'm sure there are other authorities around the world who agree as well bushcraft is fundamentally about being able to go into nature and source the resources that you need it's about the bush about what you can get from the bush, and it's about the craft. It's about your skills in being able to form things from that, whether that's wooden implements, whether that's food, cordage, fire, that is the craft of bushcraft, yeah? Equipment can be helpful, of course, yeah? A good knife and a good ax is super helpful in that, but fundamentally, bushcraft is you being able to go into the bush and saying, that species is a good source of fiber for cordage. That species is a good source of bark for fire lighting. That species is a good source of sap in the spring, leaves that I can eat in the spring. That is a good source of uh, needles that I can make a tea that's rich in vitamin C so I don't get scurvy. That one has sap in it which is good for putting on burns and infections. It's antiseptic, it's soothing. That species there has a shallow root system. I can scrape away at the earth and find the roots that are of relatively even diameter. I can remove those roots and I can make bindings with them. I can scrape off the outer material, split those roots down and make a more fine binding out of those for making um, different implements or binding up baskets or making fish hooks. I can get thorns off that tree that I can use to make fish hooks. I can get a gum from this tree which will allow me to attach things together. And um, that's bushcraft. This plant here is medicinal. This plant here is poisonous. Um, this can tell me about direction. Yeah, this is animal tracks and sign laid out on the ground that tells me about what the animals are doing. That's all bushcraft. That's all about your ability to understand what's going on in the environment and use it to your advantage. So in terms of what's the advantage of being able to identify trees, it's fundamental, absolutely fundamental to bushcraft. black Labrador come from somewhere
Good question though and worth reiterating and I make no apologies for thinking of bushcraft in that way. Um, it's about nature and it's about your understanding of the materials there. So tree and plant identification is a key part of that. Bow drill polishing. This is a question from Twitter again from Kenny. Um, I've had time over the winter to experiment with different woods for bow drills and making up kits for work however I've come across one small issue sometimes the hearth and drill get hot and polished but don't create dust any ideas yeah it's probably either you're not putting enough pressure down um, through the spindle um, and therefore uh, you're not getting enough friction initially and then it starts to polish and then you're into a vicious circle where it's harder and harder to get the friction because it's polished and even if you then press harder you might not break through that polish and it polishes even more. That's one reason and also it could be that the material is just too hard to start off with and therefore it polishes rather than starts to grind together. So those are the two reasons I've mentioned before my bow drill keys to success article on my blog at paulcutley.com uk i will link that below the video um, on youtube and on my blog so if you're listening uh, via a, an audio podcast somewhere just go to paulkirtley.co.uk forward slash ask paul kirtley 72 and in the links section you'll find a link to that article that will help with any other problems but those are the two main reasons for polishing you can sometimes get around it by dropping a little bit of dry sand in there if you've got sandy soil around or sandy rocks drop a little bit of sand in there don't throw wet earth in there that's not going to help throwing damp organic material in there is not going to help but if you've got some dry sand that you can pop in that will just help abrade those polished surfaces that can help break through that if it isn't because the wood's too hard equally you might then just have to scrape the bottom of the drill and go again putting a bit more pressure on um, and again if it's not too hard if you were just pushing too lightly initially that might be the reason otherwise it's probably because the material's too hard if it keeps um, persisting I find with willow in particular if it's slightly too hard it tends to polish uh, and then gets um, more and more difficult so um, particularly with willow species I find that the the fingernail test is really really crucial and if it's at all too hard then that starts making life exponentially more difficult so hopefully that helps Kenny good question always seem to be bow drill questions but again a lot of them are answered in that keys to success article and the many other Ask Paul Kirtleys. Just go to my blog and search on bow drill. You'll find a ton of questions across lots of different Ask Paul Kirtleys on bow drill now. Carcass inspection, and this is a voicemail question. If you'd like to leave a voicemail question, the way that you do this is you go to my site, paulkirtley.co.uk, you find the Ask Paul Kirtley section in the top menu, and then it, it, there's a link through to the speak pipe facility where you can just leave me a voicemail, and that's what this person has done. Well, hello, Mr. Kirtley. It's Adrian Spring with yet another question for the Ask Paul Kirtley podcast. Don't blame me, you asked for it. Um, my question today concerns carcasses. Um, when you are inspecting the insides, shall we say, of a carcass, um, what is it that you're looking for that tells you that that animal is no longer fit for human consumption, whether it's through an illness, disease, infection, or generally ill health all the best uh, thank you very much keep up the good work thank you no worries adrian thanks again for another good question um so uh, fundamentally the reason you've kind of alluded to it but fundamentally the reason you're expect expecting inspecting a deer carcass is to check whether or not that carcass and the meat it contains is fit for human consumption or if it is unfit for human consumption and therefore it needs to be discarded and not entered into into the food chain either in terms of your own consumption or if you're a, a trained hunter and you have the uh, 
DSC1 certification, you can tag that carcass and it can go to a game dealer and it will go into uh, the human food chain. So um, it's important for that reason, whether you're consuming it yourself or whether or not you're passing that on to somebody else to consume. And it might not be just the whole carcass that, you know, that you're looking to see, you know, there might be issues with the liver or the kidneys and they may need to be discarded, whereas the meat could be okay. So you're checking for a number of things. And overall, you're looking at the, the, the health of the animal. So if there's any obvious sign of infection, um, particularly around the mouth, any abscesses in in the in the meat or any um, pus or infection that can be a sign that something is uh, is wrong um, more specifically what you're going to look at are the lymph glands that's one of the key things that you check and there are lots and lots and lots of lymph glands but there are a key set of lymph glands that you check along uh, the if you like the the journey from mouth to intestine so as you remove that because all of that needs to be removed quite early after the deer has been shot you're going to uh, do the the gralach which is removing um, at least the green part so from the trachea down all the way to the anus if you like and all of that intestinal material the stomach all of that comes out you're going to be checking some lymph glands on there if you're taking um, the red out as well you're going to be at that stage you're going to be checking the lungs you're going to be checking the kidneys and the liver and um, you're around the the kidneys you're looking to see if there's a good amount of fat because if there isn't the animal's probably not in good condition and that can be an indication um, of issues elsewhere so you want to be you want to be looking at that but the key things you're looking at as you remove all of that are the lymph glands that are attached to various parts of that um, and if they are not healthy looking then maybe you need to have that uh, carcass uh, inspected by a vet if there are certain things it may be that you need to call for um, e external help uh, particularly if there are signs of TB a bovine TB can um, infect uh, deer and that's also transmittable to humans so that's a, that's an issue and that's one of the notifiable diseases and um, there are other notifiable diseases anthrax is a notifiable disease there's never been um, a case of anthrax in deer at least a reported case of anthrax in deer there have been a few scares but nothing reported in the UK but that is a notifiable disease foot and mouth clearly since the early 2000s when there was a big outbreak of foot and mouth in the uk foot and mouth has been very much high on the agenda and what you're looking for there uh, you're looking for lesions on the tongue in particular and you're also going to check the hooves for any lesions that are going to give some sign uh, potentially of foot and mouth disease but a lot is it, a lot of diseases will at first show in the lymph glands and if they are not looking normal and healthy if they're not looking um, that sort of grey and slightly gristly um, and not inflamed and enlarged if they're not looking that normal colour then um, sort of pinky grey and not red or white or chalky or pussy or anything like that um, that's what you're looking for um, there are also some lymph glands in the head that you need to check so once you that might be in the field or it might be back at base when you've removed the when you've removed the carcass from the field and they are key lymph glands that you have to check um, and there are a couple of other notifiable diseases uh, brucellosis and rabies again there's you know rabies in the uk is not been an issue for many 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 years because you know we're an island and there's been good uh, control of um, animals both you know in terms of wildlife as well as domesticated animals coming in and out of the country and so we don't have a problem with rabies there but again that's a notifiable disease um going back to the insides if you're taking out the liver you're going to look for liver fluke um, that would cause you to discard the liver it wouldn't be something that would cause you to discard the whole carcass um, kidneys again there might be problems with the urinary tract or there might be other issues with the kidneys that would cause you to discard the kidneys from being eaten but it wouldn't cause you to discard the whole carcass 
Um, and also if the, there are certain things to check in terms of tapeworms and you wouldn't want either th th those to go into the human consumption but in particular you wouldn't want to give them to dogs either because tapeworms complete their life cycle uh, very firmly through um, dogs as well. So there are a number of things you want to be checking but it's predominantly about making sure that the meat is good for human consumption um, and there are some reasons why you discard the whole carcass and there are other things that would cause you to discard some of the organs that you know they offal if you like that might be otherwise consumed but would leave the carcass still okay. Um, that's primarily what you're checking for and if you're interested in finding out more about that I'd recommend doing a deer stalking certificate level one um, because you learn all of that stuff as well as the um, doing the shooting test the deer identification and deer ecology and that type of thing it's worth doing that um, I'd also mention our uh, forest hunter course um, that I'm doing with Andy up in uh, Scotland, Andy Chatterton. Um, he's been on my podcast before. I'll link to that um, below this video in the links section. Um, he and I are working together to deliver a course that not only gives you the skills and knowledge that you're going to learn within a DSC-1, you're also going to get the practical um, firearms tuition you're going to get. Um, uh, going out, looking at deer sign, moving quietly, all of the practical skills that you need. And then there's the option to stay on and do the DSC one at the end of that course as well, if you want to. So it's the Forest Hunter course, it's a training course all about deer, all about stalking, shooting, moving through the landscape, finding the deer, getting up close to them, having the firearm skills. Um, no deer will actually be shot during the course. It's all about developing the skill set, including moving up to targets that you don't know um, where they're positioned and taking a safe shot and everything that leads up to that skill set. And then within that, you can also um, opt to stay on uh, the course finishes on the Friday evening, you can stay on um, to do the DSC-1 certification at the weekend. So you can come out of that with a real uh, full skill set for stalking and the basic certification for what you need to be a, uh, a deer stalker and put that food into uh, the food chain. So that's all... Um, it's very well regulated in the UK. A lot of people don't realize how well regulated it is. Um, it's a very good system. Um, firearms are clearly very well controlled in the UK and deer stalking is very well controlled in terms of both who gets to do it, where it's done, how it's done safely, and then how the animal is checked. And you know, deer are generally very healthy anyway. They're wild animals, it's healthy meat, but you do have to make these checks just in case there may be a problem with that particular deer. You know, some deer um, are, are, you know, are not as strong and healthy as others, and they may be prone to infection of various things. And then, of course, we're looking for more general problems as well. You know, it's kind of a first line of defense, if you like, in some ways, detecting things like foot, foot and mouth. So it's all of that. And, you know, the other thing I would say there is a lot of people who, you know, promote um, roadkill foraging don't know any of that stuff in the first place. And even those that do, I think, are a little bit irresponsible in saying, oh, yeah, just find this deer at the side of the road. You don't know why it's dead. Um, you don't know if it has any of these notifiable diseases. You don't necessarily know how to check it. Um, why has it got run over in the first place? Is it that it's just been unlucky or is it was it was it groggy? Was it... Um, you know, stumbling around in the road in the first place? Was it ill? Um, has it been poisoned? You know, there's all sorts of reasons why an animal might end up in a collision with a vehicle rather than just being unlucky. Um, and I don't think those things always get checked by people who um, participate in roadkill, uh, foraging, if you like, or, or, or meat consumption, or those that promote it. Um, I think there's a responsibility there uh, to make sure that people are aware of what the problems might be. But let's not overplay. You know, deer are generally a very healthy um, set of species. Um, it's good, healthy meat. It's you know, free of antibiotics, free of um, free of a lot of things that domesticated uh, animals might suffer from if they are kept in certain circumstances. Um, they're free-range wild animal at the end of the day.
So hopefully that answers your question. I think I've more than answered your question there. I've gone off on a few tangents there, Adrian. But again, as always, thank you for your question. You come up with some good, good questions that are thought provoking and bring out some good answers. This is a question from Lizzie Harrington and she asks, Hi Paul, bushcraft often encompasses sloyd, utilitarian craft for living. I am sure we all have green wood carving, baskets, containers, knives, etc. that remind us of the fantastic places and company we enjoyed whilst working on them. What are your favourite things you have made or have had made for you? Um, my latest spoon that I'm using for myself, I guess, is usually a favourite. That will vary from um time to time and i'll generally remember wh where i made that uh, and wh where i was and when i was doing that so that is something that's just a sort of ongoing thing um i have a set of utensils that i made a couple of years ago i did write an article about it but i wanted to um populate if you like a frost river canvas utensil roll and i made a set of cherry utensils to go in that and i they're simple and straightforward they're not ornate they don't have ornate carving on them that was very much intentional I wanted them to be easy to clean we use those on canoe trips and I know that's something that's close to your heart Lizzie you enjoy uh, paddling we've paddled together and um yeah, so having something that is, you know, has good utility in the field, it's nice to use, they work, they're nice objects, but then they're also not going to get full of uh, food <laughs> and be difficult to clean on a trip. Um, and they all fit in that tool roll. And I like those and I like seeing other people use them as well. Um, things that have been made for me. Uh, people have made stuff for me over the years, um, you know, little little carvings of little animals and uh, have a little owl at home that somebody carved for me that I like. Somebody else uh, carved, Terry carved me this nice, um, Amanda and I, this nice little rooster on a, on a log and that's on top of my, one of my bookshelves at home that I particularly like um, and that uh, it's always makes me smile when I see that when I'm at home. Um, I have a few other made items that weren't made specifically for me, but I really like. So I have a, um, a Swedish Corsa, a, a cup, not Kuxa. Kuxa is, a, is not a Swedish word. The Corsa, um, Corsa is um, one that I bought um, from a traditional Sami craft shop in Sweden. Very nicely made. Um, one that I take with me on my sort of boreal winter trips. Um, you, you, in some of my videos, you might see that attached to my belt. I like that very much. I also have a small uh, Sexton Saiten um, made uh, Sami knife with a beautiful sheath. It's absolutely wonderful. Lovely um, sort of burled uh, birch handle. Um, and again, that is a small knife. It's like a little utility knife as opposed to a larger knife. But that's one that I often have on my belt, again, for those winter trips in the north. Um, it, just, it just seems to fit that environment perfectly. I have it on my trouser belt and then I might have a smock on the top and then have a belt with a, with a saw and a larger knife on the outside for using around in the forest. But then I've always got the smaller utility knife, even when my smock and my other things are taken off and hung up. I might be inside a cabin, I might be inside a heated tent. I've still got my little knife there and I like that a lot. That's one of my favourite little handcrafted items that I own. Um, so those are some of the things that spring to mind initially. And the other thing I should say, um, it's not made of... Um, materials found in the forest but I, I apologize I can't actually remember who made this for me this little um, oil skin um, tinder pouch but it's really nicely made please get in touch I've, I've, I've completely forgotten who made this for me and who sent it for me so if you're watching please let me know because I'd love I'd love to if you're making these for other people I'd love to to say you know please get in touch with you and um, if people want one um, I continue to use this. It's either in the top of my rucksack or it's in my pocket. And I pop, you know, I've got, you can see I've got, I've got some nice birch bark in there um, for, for lighting a fire. And that goes in my pocket um, or in the top of my rucksack, as I say. And that's, that's something that I, that I enjoy that somebody made for me 
um, and I really appreciate that and I really apologise, I can't remember who it was, so please get in touch and tell me if you're watching this or you know who it was that made it for me and I'm happy to put other people in touch with you if you're, if you're looking to make them for other people as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question, Lizzie. There's some things that spring to mind. Um, all of those things are nice. And as I say, I'll link through to that utility roll carving project that I did because that was a fun thing to do. And um, yeah, that brings us to the end of this episode of Ask Paul Kirtley. Um, in the woods, um, another grey day, but um, you know we're getting on with our uh, early uh, part of the UK course season with um, elementary wilderness bushcraft and the woodcrafter, which is the axe course. That's all going on um, in April. And um, yeah, looking forward to more adventures, lots of time out in the woods this year, applying all the skills, sharing knowledge and skills with people, getting up to speed with, with bushcraft and being able to go into the, the forest, to go into the bush and find the resources that they need to augment their outdoor life and get the tool skills into them as well so that they can do that efficiently and safely. And that's what it's all about for me. So. Um, Hopefully I've shared a little bit of uh, wisdom with you today, a bit of knowledge, giving you some things to think about. Um, as I say, check out that Forest Hunter course if you're interested in that skill set. And I look forward to your questions uh, on episode 73, which will be the next one of Ask Paul Kirtley before too long. Take care and stay safe and I'll speak to you soon. Cheers. <laughs>